Hello, and welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction to Data Umbrella, and then um, I'm going to open up the talk, and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, but you can put any questions in the chat as we go along, and we will answer them um, at, at the right time. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube. Uh, data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are uh, fiscally hosted by Open Collective. A little bit about me, I'm a statistician data scientist, and you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub at Reshma S. We do have a code of conduct, and we thank you for helping, helping to make this a welcoming, friendly community for all. There are various ways to support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct. Another way that you can participate is to join our Discord. The link to Discord is on our website. Another way you can support Data Umbrella is to donate to our nonprofit. We are an open collective at Data Umbrella. Also, if you work for a company um, that does company match, uh, we're also on Benevity, uh, which is a platform where you can donate through your company and your company uh, matches. We have uh, quite a few libraries on YouTube. One of them is contributing to open source. We've done webinars on contributing to NumPy and Pandas and CorePython and Scikit-Learn. Uh, we also have a playlist for career advice with four really excellent speakers. Here is a um, just a sampling of some of the webinars that we have, and I'll be sharing the link to our YouTube in the chat as well. We also have a job board. It's at jobs.dataumbrella.org. We have a lot of resources on our website related to using inclusive language, accessibility, and responsibility. Um, yeah, we encourage you to check those out. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. We're on Twitter at Data Umbrella. Feel free to tweet about this event. Um, the ones that I've highlighted, such as LinkedIn, Meetup, YouTube, blog, and newsletter are the ones where we are the most active. And I will share those links in the chat as well. We have live captioning available now for this webinar. So if you are a viewer, if you go to the very top, there is a... Um, there is a um, text that says CC, and you can click on that, and um, you can see a live captioning on the bottom by um, activating that. Our next event is on January 18th, which is getting started with GitHub Actions. I'm really looking forward to that, and you can watch our Meetup page for more details when we officially post it. Today's talk is Plumer, Maintainable and Collaborative Pipelines in Jupyter. No, it didn't change it. I updated it, but it didn't update the speaker. Oh, sorry, I didn't update the title. So our speaker is Eduardo, who is interested in developing tools to deliver reliable machine learning products. Towards that end, he created Plumer, an open source Python library to compose production-ready data workflows. Eduardo holds an MS in data science from Columbia University, where he took part in computational neuroscience research. Eduardo started his data science career in 2015 at the Center for Data Science and Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And you can find um, Eduardo on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub as EDU Blancas. And sorry about that, I just didn't update the title. <laughs> Um, and with that, no I'm going to uh, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Eduardo, and we can get started. Awesome, great! Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, I'll, I'm really excited to be uh, presenting about this Plumber project that I've been working on, and we are going to be showing how uh, Plumber allows you to create more maintainable and collaborative pipelines in Jupyter. So let's get started. So first, let's introduce the problem, because Plumer addresses one problem that I've encountered many, many times in, in my data science practice. Uh, when, when we start using Jupyter notebooks, uh, we may start adding some code, some charts. And then at some point, if, if our project is complex, uh, and by complex, I mean more than one person is editing the project, or we have more than one uh, data set, Start, things start to get messy, right? We, we have a single notebook that does, let, let's say we are working on a machine learning project. Um, we have a single notebook that does everything from data loading, data cleaning, feature engineering, uh, model training, model evaluation, 
and it gets really hard to maintain because we have a single file that does everything and there aren't any like clear boundaries between one section and the next one. So what happens um, if you are working in, 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 in some industry, in some private company, uh, you usually have to refactor. That's, that's what most people um, do. They refactor their notebooks into Python modules and then they deploy. But this also applies for research projects. If you are uh, doing some um, research, you may also start with the Jupyter Notebook. And then if you want your results to be reproducible, you may want to change and refactor your code, maybe write some functions and write some Python modules and then publish your code so that other people can reproduce it. So this problem applies to, to all projects that analyze data. Um, Jupyter Notebooks get, get hard to maintain, so you have to refactor them. And then you have like a final artifact that other people can use. Um, so notebooks have uh, many, many problems. And, and that's the reason why uh, many practitioners resort to this refactoring approach. Uh, because, and I, and I can give a, a few examples of, of one of the problems. And, and, and the one, the first one I, I already um, mentioned it is that when we start working on notebooks, if we have a single notebook that contains everything, it's really hard to maintain, right? Imagine uh, how, how two people or three people uh, could edit the same notebook. It, it gets really complicated. Uh, now, the second thing is that the traditional IPy and B format do not plays, uh, does not uh, pl play nicely with Git. Uh, and you can see an example here. For example, if I, if I have a, a, a Jupyter notebook and then I push it to GitHub and then I make a really small change, so in this case, I only added one new code cell uh, with a single uh, comment. So that's it, new cell, uh, add a one line command uh, comment. And then this is what GitHub shows me as the difference between my previous uh, version and the new one. So why is that happening? Um, the IPyME format contains inputs and outputs in the same file. So the inputs are your code and the outputs are whatever your code um, outputs. So that can be something simple like a string, like a message, can be a table. For example, when you have a pandas data frame and you uh, execute just like the df variable, you're going to see a table uh, with the first rows. Uh, or can be a chart. If you are using matplotlib or seaborn or any of uh, those plotting libraries, you get this, um, this out output, this chart as part of the output. So your ipy and b file contains all those things. And it's really hard to track those changes. And most of the time, you're, you only care about the code changes. Um, so that's, that's another problem with notebooks. And the final problem uh, has to do with uh, out of order execution. So when we, are, when we have a notebook, it's, it's really great to like create a new cell, then a new one, then maybe we fix a little thing. And let's say we have three cells, right? Like a really simple example, only three cells, one, two, three. You may execute the first one, the second one, and the third one. Then we may realize that we actually need to execute the second one again. So we go back and execute it. And all of a sudden, we have hidden state. Like if someone comes, gets the same notebook, and executes the first, the second one, and the third, they are not going to get the same result because we actually executed uh, cells, in, cells in different order. Uh, so that creates many, many issues, especially for reproducibility, because you may have a notebook with outputs and then if you copy it and run it from top to bottom, like cells in, in, in strictly in, in, in order, you may get different outputs. And that causes all sorts of issues in, in many, many data products. I would say that's one of the most common issues um, when people use notebooks. So now going back to our refactoring problem, uh, refactoring your notebooks is risky and wasteful. It's risky because if you already have your code and it works, um, and this has happened to me many times. I already have a notebook that works and I'm happy with the results, but I need to refactor it so it's cleaner and it's more maintainable. And the moment I start uh, taking pieces and moving them around, maybe I write a function or I split my notebook into three, four scripts, sometimes I'm not able to reproduce my results. And it's really frustrating because my code already works. Now I have to spend extra time figuring out what I did wrong. Maybe I, I copy pasted um, incorrectly or I'm, I'm missing some lines of code. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and it's, it's risky. Um, so in the end, you, you may end up with, with something that does not produce the same results. Or, or maybe you do if you, if you, are, if you put a lot of effort. Um, but it takes a lot of time, right? And we don't want that. What we want is, uh, and that's the, that's the idea behind Plumber. Like if we, we already have a tool, which is Jupyter Notebooks, that's really powerful for exploring data. Um, 
should have the tools to take that work into a cleaner, more maintainable state without going through this refactoring uh, stage. And that's where when, uh, Plumber comes in. So Plumber is, a, is an open source framework that fixes uh, the problems uh, uh, when you are developing data pipelines. So I, I would say that when, um, when you are working on a small project, it, it makes sense to, to have a single notebook. Like if you uh, are working on like some small data set project, you shouldn't complicate yourself and, and only write uh, code um, in a single notebook. But as, as I mentioned before, as, um, as soon as you have more than one person or, or more than one data set, you should think in terms of a data pipeline. And a data pipeline is just a way of organizing our work uh, and saying, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna break down my logic and I'm gonna do task A, task B, task C. And in this way, you are breaking down the logic and people can collaborate and you can test your tasks in isolation. So that's the idea with Plumer. How do you go from um, a, a, a Jupyter notebook to something that's like broke down depending on, on, on the logic? And just to give you some example, let's say that you are working on a, on, on a machine learning pipeline and you have two data sets. So you may have five tasks. The first one could be loading your data. The second one would be cleaning that data. Then you have another branch here, and you may load the second data set, and then you clean the second data set, and then you join those two data sets and then train a model. Um, so you can see that even, even by looking at this diagram, it's clear what each part is doing. And if you are working with someone else, it's easier for them uh, for you to tell them, uh, you know, uh, maybe we need to change the data cleaning logic, so you know you have to edit this file. Um, and it's just an easier way to organize your work and, and collaborate. Now, that's for, the, the, that's for the data pipeline part. Now, how does Plumber actually work? And I'm gonna run a, 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 a demo in a few minutes, but just stay with me with these ideas because these are important uh, for you to understand what's the logic behind Plumber. So the first one, I mentioned that it's hard to um, use Jupyter Notebooks when you are using Git and GitHub or any other uh, Git service because the IPINB file contains both input and output. So with Plumber, we separate those things. So the first thing that you can notice here is that each of the tasks is a .py file. But the difference is that with Plumber, uh, and we use Jupyter for this, this is a great, great library, um, we convert those .py files into notebooks. So even though you are actually editing a .py file, you can open it in Jupyter and run it as a notebook. And, and you'll see this in the demo. Um, the second thing is that when you execute your pipeline, meaning you execute all the five tasks in the order that, that, that they appear based on these arrows, these are the dependencies, um, Plumber turns your .py file into an IPINB file, so it creates a copy. It creates a copy of your .py file in IPINB format, and it then executes your code. So essentially, every time you run your code, you get notebooks as an output, and you can use those for bookkeeping. For example, if you are running multiple experiments, you may run your pipeline once and then have those notebooks as a reference. And then let's say you change your model settings or, or the way you are cleaning your data, then uh, you change your code, you run your pipeline again, and you get a new set of output notebooks. And then you can use those notebooks um, to compare how the output changes depending on, on model changes or data changes or anything. And apart from the output notebook, your tasks can also generate other types of files. For example, um, in this case, my, um, my pipeline is generating output CSV files for each task. So the, the, the idea behind a pipeline is that the output of, your, of one task, in, in, uh, for this example, that would be load data.py, the output of this script becomes the input of the next one. And then we just repeat the same process. So Plumber started as a single, as a, as, a, as a command line tool, right? So that's the one that we have here. And as I explained before, it allows you to develop pipelines in Jupyter and iterate faster and organize your work. Now, based on user feedback, we have created another, uh, another um, tool. That was like the second tool, that's a supervisor, which allows you to take your Plumber pipelines and deploy them to the cloud. So there are uh, two, main, mainly there are two use cases for people who are using supervisor. The first one is, you have a notebook, uh, maybe you are training a model or you are running some analysis, 
uh, but now you need a larger machine or maybe you even need to use a cluster like Kubernetes or AWS or Airflow. We support those three platforms. So you export your Plumber pipeline and then uh, you can run them in, in a larger scale to train more experiments at the same time or maybe just because you need some uh, more memory or you need more CPUs, more GPUs. That's a really convenient way of having uh, your code in, in a Jupyter notebook. And Without any code changes, without any refactoring, you can run, run it in a larger scale. Uh, so this is the second tool that, that we developed. And, and the last one we recently introduced, actually we open sourced it a few weeks ago, is called Surgeon. And this came because we, we when we talk to um, users, people who are interested in this tool, they sometimes tell us, uh, you know, Plumber looks like a really amazing tool that could help us. Uh, develop more maintainable projects, but we already have those legacy notebooks that we don't want to modify. They already work. Uh, we don't want to risk ourselves breaking the logic, which is exactly the problem that I explained before, right? They have legacy notebooks. And they don't want to modify them because uh, first, it takes time, and second, it's risky to do it by hand. So essentially, and, and this is surgeon is to be part of the demo, so you're going to see how it works. Essentially, this tool takes an input legacy notebook and analyzes the code it extracts the dependencies and it spits a, a plumber pipeline. So it's just an automated way of taking a legacy notebook and then starting um, um, to use plumber. Um, and we are really excited to, to see um, that, that this is going to help people start with plumber, uh, even, even if they have legacy notebooks. OK, so just a, a few links. Uh, this is open source. So you can uh, go to GitHub. Uh, Plumber, Plumber, and uh, you can find all the resources there. Um, you can try it out. You can download from Pete for some examples. We also have a community, a Slack community. So if you're interested and if you have any questions uh, or you have any feedback that you want to submit or just chat uh, with us, uh, please join our community. And finally, our website, um, which also has some smaller resources and all the links that you need um, if you want to learn more. Uh, now. Uh, let's start with the demo, so we see how how this how this works. What I'm going to show you now is um, how we go from a legacy notebook, uh, and then we get the, the Plumber pipeline, and then we modularize everything, and we start experimenting. So first, I only have a single I have a single file in NB IPNB. That's our legacy notebook, and let me open that one so you see what the contents are. So this is a typical machine learning pipeline. And it's actually pretty simple, um, simpler than a real uh, project, for sure. So we just have um, a pipeline has a few sections. Load, it's loading some data. Um, let, me, let me run this so we see the outputs. So I'm loading some sample data here in the first section. And then, uh, so I'm loading here. Then I clean the data. The details aren't important. Just uh, bear in mind that we have a notebook, legacy notebook with a few sections. Then I'm cleaning some data. So before I clean, I just generate a chart. Then I apply a few filters using pandas, create a new chart, um, a box plot, uh, another filter. And please, if, if, my, uh, if the screen looks uh, funky again, please let me know. I think it should be, should be uh, good now, uh, but just in case. Uh, I apply a new filter, uh, create a new chart. That's the cleaning step. Now we are going to train our machine learning models. So I train, test, uh, I split between training and testing. So I, you can see that here. And then I use those, uh, those new variables to train a model. So I am training two models. The first one is a linear regression. You can see the code here. I um, instantiate the model, then I fit, generate predictions using the testing set, and I generate a scatter plot to evaluate how the predictions look like. And then I repeat the same process with, with, with a different model. So a random forest, same idea. Uh, feed the model, uh, do a, uh, make a few predictions, and then uh, have an evaluation evolution chart. So you can, you could imagine that this is something, some notebook that you already have, uh, some project that you have already been working on. But now you want to use Plumber to accelerate your work, to run more experiments, to modularize your work. So what happens now is uh, this, these commands, uh, running this with the sh thing is the same thing as running them in a ter in the terminal. So these are these are uh, command line. Uh, this is a command line tool, and you can open a terminal and run run this. It, it's the same thing. OK, so now what I'm going to do is if you look at this command, it's surgeon refactor, and I'm passing the NB, IPI NB as an input. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm doing right now is telling surgeon to analyze the, the contents of that notebook, 
figure out the dependencies between sections and give me an output plumber pipeline. Okay, so it finished. Now, uh, remember that before I only had a single file, the ipnb file, and now you can see that I have um, more files. And you can actually see that on the left bar that I have a pipeline YAML. So the two important things to notice here is that I have a pipeline YAML file. That's the, the file that Plumber uses to specify data pipelines and tasks. So let's go to tasks first. You can see that I have one, two, three, four, five files, and these correspond to each of the sections in our original notebook. So you can see that we have load here, and we have it here, and we have clean, clean. Uh, then we have train test split, which is here, linear regression here, and random forest. That's here. So what Surgeon did is it split your no it splits the notebook depending on the the sections that you have and then it organ reorganizes everything into uh, multiple files. Now let's, uh, well, I can, can print the, the files that we have. You can see that it matches the sections. Now uh, let's forget about Surgeon. Surgeon did their, uh, their work already. We have a Plumber pipeline. So now we go to the second stage, which is how do we use Plumber to uh, create more maintainable work? And you can see that we are now using the Plumber command line interface. And the first thing that I'm going to do is to create a, a, a diagram of our pipeline so we see how the inputs and outputs flow from the first task to the next one. OK, so you can see it here um, that we have one, two, three, four, five tasks. And, and the, the structure is important. The first task is load. So we load the data. Uh, then we clean the data. Then we uh, split. Uh, our data in training and testing. And then we train a linear regression and a random forest. So a few important things to notice here. The first one is uh, you can see that Plumber automatically, well, that was actually Surgeon. Surgeon analyzes your code, and then it infers the dependencies between your sections. And it knows that it has to execute one load, then clean, then training, testing, split. And finally, it also figure out that linear regression depends on the training, testing, split but it doesn't depend on the random forest, right? These are two independent tasks, and that's why they look like this, like a, a branch, um, and you can run them in parallel. So that's also another um, side effect of having a pipeline, is that since you organize your work in, in smaller tasks, you can um, run things that are independent from each other in parallel. Okay, so now let's let's uh, run the run this uh, plumber status command that uh, spits a, a small a small table with the summary of our pipeline just to make sure that everything's working correctly. Okay, um, so we have the table, and now uh, let me explain how the pipeline YAML file works. So uh, we have these .py files. I'm going to show how to open these as notebooks in a moment, uh, but now let's go back to this folder and open pipeline YAML. Pipeline YAML is where we specify our source code and the outputs of each uh, task in our pipeline. So you can see that we have a task section here. And there are two elements to each task. The first one is the source, which is where is the code that you want to execute. And the second one is product. And products are outputs that your, um, that your code generates. In this case, for example, what we are um, saying here is that load.py generates a data frame here and a notebook. And uh, remember what I explained when, when I was um, doing, uh, showing the slides that each .py file uh, is converted into an ipnb file and then it's executed. So any tables or charts that this script generates, you can review them later here. And if you make any changes, you get a new notebook and you can compare both um, to spot any differences. Um, this is really useful if you are experimenting and making small changes and you want to see how those changes affect your, your results. And then we just repeat the same thing. It, it's the same, the same template for every task. Uh, we can, let's go to, for example, clean. So we have the source and we have the product. You can see that this one also generates a data frame and a notebook. Uh, now, in some cases, your uh, scripts may generate more than, more than one output. So you can see that in the training testing split task that we have multiple outputs, but we still have the, uh, the notebook output. And then for the final two tasks, it's really simple. Uh, we actually only need the, uh, the notebook. They don't generate anything else. Uh, and then this was automatically generated as part of the refactoring that we did uh, with Surgeon. 
But if you start a project from scratch, uh, you can edit this by hand. And, and, and even, even now that we have this Python YAML file, if we want to modify anything, uh, we can come here and add new tasks, which is what, I, what I'm going to be uh, doing now. Um, so just remember, Pipeline YAML, you specify your tasks, your source, your products, and that's it. There are a few other things that you can do, but this is like the most, the most basic uh, example of a pipeline. Now it's time to run the pipeline. This is going to take uh, about 20, 30 seconds. So what, what we are doing right now is let's go back to the diagram. Uh, we, we only have our source code. But we haven't executed anything, so we don't have any of the outputs. When we execute Bloomberg build, we run the tasks in order. So that means load, then clean, then train, test, split, in a regression, and random forest. So by default, uh, Plumber runs these tasks uh, in single, so one task at a time. But you can also tell uh, Plumber to run tasks in parallel. Uh, so for example, if you have many, many models at the end and that are independent from each other, you can run them in, in parallel. So let's see if, if the execution finished. Yes, we can see that we executed Plumber build. Now we have a summary table. Uh, tells us the name of the task, if it ran, and how much time it, it took to, to finish. And now if we take a look at the output folder, we are going to see all the files that I described before in Pipeline YAML, so all the products. We can see those here. Uh, we have the data frames, we have a bunch of notebooks, um, more, more notebooks, and, and, and more uh, the training testing split. So all the, all the outputs are generated now. Now let's take a look at the uh, the diagram again. Let's imagine that we we refactor our, our legacy notebook, but we now want to add a new model. Maybe maybe we want to add a new model at the end. So instead of having uh, two models, maybe we want a new one because we want to run more experiments. We want to know how a different model behaves uh, using the same data. So how do we how do we do that? We uh, need to edit our Python YAML file. Uh, so let me copy these few lines here and then go to pipeline jamble. And I'm going to add a new task. Do so you see that this is the tasks section? So let me just add a new one. Uh, and I have to save this. So what we are doing here is we are saying we want another task, and that's going to be located in tasks, gradient, boosting, regressor, and then it's only going to generate. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, we are seeing mm -hmm. your a notebook number four building the pipeline. Now it just went to the, the pipeline.yaml. Okay, maybe there was a delay. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for letting me know. So um, as I was as I was saying, we, we now have the pipeline jaml file and we added a new task. So we have um, we, we only declared the, the, the new the new task. We haven't done anything, we haven't created the file. Uh, so what we are saying is we want a new task, right? Um, I'm going to switch to the index IPNB and let me know if you can see the index IPNB now. It's in the pipeline. Uh, yeah. I would probably say it's probably a good idea to turn off your video for a while. Um, All right. Um, like delays and stuff, but right now we see the pipeline.yaml file. Okay, let me find. Okay, turn off. Uh, okay. All right. Um, can you see the index not IPNB? Yes. Maybe I'll, I'll just wait for a few seconds to see if um, it, it shows the index not IPNB. Yep, we can see index.ipynb and it says open playground slash pipeline dash YAML. Okay, great. So now, uh, so we, we finished editing the pipeline YAML file and now I'm going to execute this command plumber scaffold. So what this command does is that it looks at your pipeline YAML file and then it um, looks for missing files. So right now we only have one missing file, uh, which is the gradient booting regressor file. And it's going to create that one for us. And now let me generate uh, the plot. So we execute again uh, Plumber plot. And we are going to see that Plumber recognizes this as a new task. I'll give it a few seconds to generate the 
the diagram. Okay, it finished. Now let's um, show the diagram here. Okay, so now we have a new version. Uh, um, can, can you see the new diagram? I should, should be uh, like a bunch of uh, like small diagram. Yes, we can see the diagram of ellipses. Great. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like the video is, is, is working uh, good now. So now you can see that we have the old pipeline with one, two, three, four, um, five tasks. And we have this new one, which is completely isolated from the rest. That's because we haven't specified our dependencies. And what we want is to tell Plumber that we want to execute this new task as part of the, the model training step, right? So it should come after this task, which is train test split. So how do we do that? Uh, now I'm going to show how we open .py files as notebooks. So I'll go to my tasks folder and then uh, gradient uh, boosting regressor. So I do right click and then open with notebook. Okay, so now you can see that it's a .py file, but I'm editing as a notebook. So uh, we don't lose any of the interactivity of Jupyter, but with benefit of having a .py file um, that uh, it's easier to maintain and, and, and to version with Git. So how do we tell uh, Plumber that we want to execute one task before we execute this gradient boosting regressor? We use this special upstream variable. So right now it's set to none, uh, but if we want to run a few tasks before this one, we simply uh, create a list. And then inside that list, we specify the tasks that we want to run before. So in this case, this is going to be train, test, split. And that's it. I just have to save this. And now, look what, what's going to happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reload this file. So I'll go to File, and then Reload Python file from disk. And looks what, uh, look what happened now. This is the, the cell that I um, originally changed, where I specified my upstream dependency. And now, what I'm doing is um, I'm, uh, this, this is automatically injected for me. So I didn't have to edit this cell. Plumber automatically uh, detects that I'm detects that I'm saying I want to execute train train test split. So then it goes to pipeline jaml and extracts the outputs from that task so that I can use them as inputs. And that, that means you don't have to hard code anything. If you change your pipeline jaml file and then open this file, you're going to see the, the latest values. Um, so now I have all, all the information that I need to keep working on my pipeline and add a new model. So let me just copy paste some sample code that trains this, um, this new model. So I'll just copy a few lines of code. And let me go back to gradient boosting regressor. And I'll run this like uh, if I, like, like a notebook, right? So I have a few import statements and I run this. And, and it's really, really important to stress the importance of using Jupyter because when you are um, doing data science, machine learning, there's a, a huge experimentation component when you where you have to try many small different things. So having this interactive environment helps a lot. Uh, now look what, what I'm doing. I am loading my input data by making a reference to my upstream uh, variable. So I originally said um, my upstream dependencies, dependencies are these. Uh, and now Plumber adds this for me with the paths to the input files. So then I can simply come here and say, load my data, then uh, train the model, and then uh, generate a chart. So let me run this. Okay, it's working. And now I may say, okay, I'm happy with my results. My code is working, my new model is working, and I'm gonna save this new task. And then I come back to my index.ipmb. In your case, this could be going back to your terminal and executing uh, Plumber build again. So something interesting is going to happen now um, that I'm going to execute Plumber build. Remember, we already executed most of the pipeline. We executed the pipeline, then we added a new task. And now we are calling Plumber build uh, to execute the pipeline again. So look what happened here. Um, we now have a new row here because we have a new task. And this executed because we, we only run it interactively, but we never run it as part of a Plumber pipeline. 
So Bloomberg is missing the output file, so it executes that, but it doesn't execute any of the previous tasks because they are going to generate the same result. So Plumber keeps track of source code changes. So if, if your uh, source code is the same, then it uses the previously generated results. And if you change your code, it marks your task as outdated and it runs it again. Um, this is what we call incremental builds. And the idea is that um, this allows you to experiment a lot faster because when you, when you are doing uh, data science machine learning, you have a pipeline and you make small changes. It's, it's never the case that you grad your, regrad your pipeline from scratch, right? You may uh, try out a new pre-processing method. You may try a new model, for example. This is what we what we did here. We tried a new model, um, or you may change your your code uh, a little bit, and then you come to Plumber Build, and it's only going to execute the things that that are outdated, and this saves a lot of time and it allows you to uh, experiment a lot faster. Uh, so that's it for the demo. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to show you how you can execute things in the cloud, uh, but you can uh, go to our GitHub page and your, or our documentation, and you can find recorded presentations of how we uh, start with the Plumber pipeline, and, and then we run things in Kubernetes, AWS, or Airflow. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, if there are any questions, I can take those now. So I have a question uh, just to begin with uh, as we wait for people to post their questions in the chat is, can you explain a little bit about what a YAML file is? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so a YAML file is um, it's like a, a JSON file, right? It's just a way of organizing, representing dictionaries or lists in a, in a text file. Right, so if you are in Python, you, you can um, specify a list with square brackets, right? Now, let's say you want to save that in a file because you want to recover that information uh, maybe tomorrow. You can use different formats. One of those is the JSON file. YAML is simply another format of representing structured data uh, in text. The benefit of YAML is that it is, it's more human readable. So you can come and say, I want to ask. So source, and then say tasks and then new.py. So you can see that I'm editing this text file, but it has a certain, certain structure. Task is a list, source is a dictionary. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, it does. Um, okay. I have another question, which is, um, in your example, you used pickle files, right? And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, is it possible to also do this workflow using, say, feather files or other? other yes. Files? That's a great question. And I should have mentioned that because it's really, really important. So the reason why, uh, remember that this pipeline came from the automated process of refactoring a legacy notebook, right? Since we don't know much about the user's code, we, we use pickle files because they can, they can serialize many different data types like data frames uh, or NumPy arrays. You can use Pickle to serialize pretty much anything. Uh, there's a caveat, there's a security caveat. So our recommendation is if you are refactoring legacy notebooks, um, whenever, as soon as you can, change these Pickle files to something like Feather or Parquet or even CSV files. So that, uh, that, that's a great point. If you're starting from scratch, if you're starting a new project from scratch, then uh, yes, use Feather or Parquet or any of other or, or any of those formats. So we have a question in the Q&A, which is, Plumer looks really cool. Your blog on survey of WMS tools, which I'm not sure what WMS equals, but maybe the person can say, tools is very helpful. Do you plan on updating it to reflect any recent developments, especially how Plumer fits with or compares against Prefect? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, so that's, that's probably the workflow survey that, that we did uh, a few months ago. Uh, yes, that, that needs some, some updates, definitely. Uh, we basically reviewed uh, all the tools that we found that are similar to Plumber and tried to evaluate in terms of a data scientist perspective. Um, because there are many tools out there, uh, but we are building something specific for data science. So for example, if you use Airflow, Airflow is a, magnif uh, a great, great tool, but it doesn't um, take, it's not tailored to a data science workflow. Uh, so we want to, that's the reason why we did a survey to like be um, transparent in terms of 
what are the benefits, and what are the caveats of each tool. So yeah, definitely, I think we, we definitely need to update that blog post. So the next question that I had is, um, I've been doing a little bit with scikit-learn pipelines, and I'm just sort of curious where the scikit-learn pipeline fits into fits into your workflow. I guess it would be in the analysis portion of it. Um, and I'm just wondering if yeah, you that's, used it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question as well. And and I and I think that there's uh, definitely. Um, some overlap. So what I would what I would say is that Plumer allows you. So let, let me go back to the diagram to make things. Uh, yeah, here the diagram. So I would say that a Plumer pipeline takes care of the whole life cycle of your workflow, like from loading data to cleaning, training, testing, speed. And when you start using Scikit-Learn pipelines, that's when I, I that's where um, when you already have your training data, your clean data. So I would say uh, Scikit-Learn pipeline is a subset of your Plumber pipeline. So if if um, if I had to use a, a scikit-learn pipeline, I put it in the last task, like just before I'm gonna train my model. Okay, great. Um, and the next question is, can you comment briefly on how Plumer fits with or compares against Prefect? Yeah, sure. Um, so actually we have had uh, people that, um, use Plumber and also use Prefect. So the feedback has been that uh, for some of the data teams, uh, data scientists feel really, really comfortable with Jupyter Notebooks. So before they started using Plumber, they exclusively used Prefect. So they have to refactor their notebook. So exactly what I mentioned in, in the first couple of slides, that they have a notebook and then they have, have to refactor that into a Prefect workflow. Um, and now some of these users that now use both, both tools, Plumber and Prefect, um, they, the data scientists like using Plumber because it's a lot simpler. And of course, when you use a framework, we are always making a decision in terms of trade-offs. Like we are targeting, we are tailoring uh, Plumber for data scientists, but Prefect has some other use cases that we don't cover. So I think it's important given uh, how many different tools we have, that's, that's also the purpose of the survey, uh, to determine what's the right tool for the job, um, meaning, what, what you're doing with the data, what's the purpose of that workflow, but also who's going to own that workflow, who's editing that code, who's developing that. So I would say uh, Plumber is uh, a lot more data science, uh, data scientist friendly, uh, and Prefect has some other uh, more, more like engineering uh, features. So um, I guess, um... One of the other questions I had is, where do you sort of see the role of Plumer in um, reproducible, reproducible data science? Uh, that's that's a great question. I would say that, um, it makes it easy to run your entire workflow. Um, of course, if you are only doing uh, a single notebook, like all your code in a single notebook, you can simply execute run all, right? Run all the cells and check if it's reproducible. But Plumber gives more tools to ensure that your work is actually reproducible. And, and one of those tools are the output notebooks. And this is something that I've done in previous projects. I start using Plumber um, and then to make sure that I that my work is reproducible, I keep, keep my output notebooks um, and then I compare uh, if I made a change, like how that changed the results. It also makes it a lot simpler for people to share their work. Uh, we just had someone who developed a, a, a pipeline that analyzes COVID data. And it was really interesting to, to take uh, the GitHub with me because all you have to do is run Plumber build, right? Um, the pipeline is quite complex. It has like 10, 10 15 tasks. Uh, but given that this person is using Plumber, from a, from a user's perspective, from someone who wants to use the word, they just have to pip install, then Plumber build, and that's it. They, they reproduce the work. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you plan on offering any enterprise support for Plumer? Yeah, yeah, we are definitely evaluating that, especially now that uh, many companies are using this in production. There's definitely um, requests from uh, from their end to support 
uh, more like enterprise uh, features. So we are definitely evaluating that. And I mean, it's, it's great. It's a great evolution of the project to see that there is so much interest, um, but we still need to find a good strategy for that, like a sustainable way of, of both uh, taking care of our open source community and also um, making sure that enterprise uh, users are also happy with the, with the experience. So do you want to, um, there's no questions at the moment, so do you want to take a few minutes and share about, you know, how you started Plumer, why you started Plumer, sort of, so what led you to this development? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me see if I can turn on my camera, so uh, stop sharing so you can see me. Uh, yeah, I can share the story. So it, it started mostly because of my experience as a data scientist. Like, I, I didn't... Um, I, I always heard this uh, over and over again about, okay, now you can see me, um, this story about notebooks are only for prototyping. And it never never felt like a good explanation, right? Of course, notebooks have uh, limitations. That's, that's normal for every tool. But then at some point I thought, well, how can we fix those problems so that people can uh, work in Jupyter? Because I, I, it's just an amazing tool. Uh, how can we add some other features that allow people to build more maintainable projects? So it actually, it actually went through like an idea stage where I tried many things. Um, most of them didn't work, and it didn't work because it, it, the workflow didn't seem right. It was like not, not really fast and, and lean and dynamic as it is right now. Uh, and it was only me using it. So after a couple iterations, I started to have some more ideas of how, uh, how from a user standpoint would look like, tried a few things, and once it kind of worked, I open sourced it. And for the first couple of months, uh, I was like improving it, improving it. And then I started to get some GitHub issues. Uh, I also started to get some emails from, from users. And then at, at that moment, I realized that people were excited about a tool that allowed you to develop these pipelines in Jupyter. So I started to double down on the efforts, improve the experience, write more documentation. Um, because it, it's like a big effort, right? Uh, giving presentations also, so people could find about the project. And it just uh, went from there. Uh, and now it's, it's, a, it's a community that's growing and it's really, it's really great to see um, that it's, it's helping people do more, uh, create more, be more productive at work and also create more maintainable projects. So it started just as, as uh, based on my own experience as a data scientist. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so if anybody else has any more questions, please post on chat. I'll probably just ask a couple of questions um, in terms of, you know, where do you see um, Plumer going in terms of, you know, as an open source project and how it could be supported? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that I ask myself um, every day. Like I'm really excited to be helping, and, and I was I mentioned this at the beginning. Like we've been getting a lot of interest from researchers um, because I think researchers have have this profile that they do like lots of complex um, analysis, and they don't want to deal and, and and even myself, right? I don't want to deal with the complexities of infrastructure and setting up a cluster or like managing uh, computational resources. So I think right now one of our priorities is to work with the researchers that are already using Plumber for small projects and help them scale their, their work. Um, most universities have these, um, these large computational clusters and many people uh, don't use them because they don't know how to, or they don't want to waste their time like exporting their work to this, you know, this other platform. And we want to automate all that, that uh, process for them. Like they should be able to open a Jupyter notebook do the analysis, do their work, and then scale uh, the, the analysis to, to a cluster without changing the code. So I think that's, that's one of the big milestones um, that we are definitely going to be putting a lot of work into that in the next few months. Oh, great. Um, another question that I sort of just had in general is, is there, and you may have mentioned it, is there an option to sort of turn off printing? Because I think that's one of the... Um, sort of issues I faced along the pipeline, like if the output is too much to actually run it, but not have out output. Uh, when you say printing, do you mean the, the output message from the command line or from the notebooks? In the, in the Jupyter notebook. Uh, okay, uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I think there's one, um, one command 
that's called capture output because I've, I've used it before. Uh, and then it, it stores all the output from that cell uh, into a variable. And then you decide what do you want to do if you want to suppress the output and just hide it, or maybe you want to do something with it. There's definitely a way of doing it because I've done it uh, a few times before. But yeah, I was just going to say because sometimes when you push um, output to Git, notebooks that have very long output to Git, there's there's some issues that, that can be. Yeah, and another way to fix that problem is uh, by using, that's why we recommend Plumber users to use .py files because they only store your code. And then when you execute your Plumber pipeline, you get the output notebooks. Uh, so that's another way of solving this issue because, yeah, I agree. When you when you have notebooks with long outputs, it gets gets really hard to understand what's going on. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. Um, so I will, um, you know, I'll be, we'll be signing off. Um, I want to thank you so much um, for joining us, Eduardo, and presenting. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was great. Um, really excited. This is the first time that I show this new tool that refactors legacy notebooks. So I'm really excited to, um, to be here and speak. And thanks a lot for, for having me.